Traveling safety for Commissioner Hughes as she comes back in from Washington, D.C. And pray for Commissioner Riggin, God, as he's sick. They just pray you touch his body and heal him. And Lord, we just ask you to give us wisdom tonight, discernment, and let us make the best decisions for our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have a lot of visitors in our audience tonight, which is good. Welcome our city council parks. Uh, Acting city manager Emily Beeman and Ricky Hobby and Larry Lawrence. Thank y'all for coming. We have the chairman of the Copper County Commission with us tonight, Denver Bradley. Good to have y'all with us. So, all right, we have anyone in the audience that'd like to come speak to us for five minutes or less. All right, see you then. Yeah, uh, is that on any topic? Yes. If, if it's on a talk, topic, it's on the agenda. If you're here to talk about the, the, uh, the zoning matter, then they'll be in the public hearings where you have to speak about that. So if you want to talk about anything that's not on the agenda, you can come up and now and talk about it. Okay. Sorry. Anyone? All right. All right, we do have one appointment uh, that's made to speak with us tonight. We have Michael Stubb with us and, uh, to come talk to us about the landfill options that we, uh, the decision we have to make. You want to make a more? Yes, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Mr. Stubbs, who is a, an engineer, has worked with us now for 15, 16 years on the landfill, Michael. And, uh, and, and we have had some preliminary discussions, you know, that our, our current line the line portion of our landfill is, is approaching uh, its end of life. And what Michael's here to do is kind of discuss what what that means, what the time frame is, and, and, and what our, you know, some of our options are. Michael. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioners. So again, Michael Stubbs, uh, registered engineer, been practicing for goodness, 26, 27 years, mainly solid waste over the country, primarily the southeastern U.S., and then working uh, with Ricky and Jim and these guys here for 10 or 15 years going forward. So my job tonight is just kind of tell you the lay of land um, and what, what's going on at Landfill and kind of some decisions that are going to need to be made one way or the other um, and what they might look like. So in the Landfill business, um, your facility has a 30-acre line footprint. So that's 30 acres where we're storing waste over line. All right? That's on one hand. On the other hand, you have an unlined unit that's pre-1993. That's the way we store waste in our country, pre-1993, an unlined unit, and they're separated by a ditch, all right? The 30-acre line unit is where we've been storing waste for the last 20-some-odd years, and that facility's doing fine, but it's built out. Your permit uh, issued through EPD and all the other federal agencies um, have limits what we call a footprint. All right, so that 30 acres is built out, and if you just imagine filling up a 30-acre um, bowl, that's what you're doing. You're filling up a 30-acre bowl. Um, obviously, some prosperity and some growth here, and our tonnage that's going in that facility is roughly about 200 tons a day. And so if you think about it this way, 
it's a bowl, you're filling it up, it's got a set capacity, and that capacity is only affected by two things. I mean, the cones we put in, and how tight we pack it. All right, so based on the current tightness that we're packing it and the tons coming in, we've got roughly about four years before that permitted footprint is full. Um, so right now, you're operating it, you're doing fine, you're filling above ground. Obviously, the taller you get, the more expensive it gets to fill, so the operating expenses are kind of creeping up a little bit. That's all normal, that's gonna happen. But what's gonna happen in four years? All right, so in four years, it, that's what I'll call just kind of the keep going like we're going option. If you do nothing, what's gonna happen is in four years, that landfill's gonna reach capacity. Tub's full, nothing else to do. And what we essentially do in the landfill business and the and the permit holder, um, which is Tiffin Tip County, um, you got to close that landfill. You've got to put the same liner system on top that you got on bottom. You button it up, you seal it up, you collect the gas from it, you grow grass on top of it, and that's gonna about 30 acres of that, just for round numbers, it's gonna cost about two hundred thousand dollars an acre to close. So just roughly six million bucks. And of course things don't get cheaper in this world, so in four years I would imagine it would be more expensive. But you're gonna button it up and you're gonna close that landfill. Um, then you're going to enter something called post-closure. The state of Georgia, in fact, every state in this country, requires a minimum 30-year post-closure period. So for the next 30 years after y'all buttoned up, you're going to be monitoring that landfill, making sure nothing's going on, making sure that it is being maintained in post-closure. So that's the, the do-nothing option. Now, when that happens, you've got roughly 200 tons today in this community that has to find a place to go. Right, it's still got to go somewhere. And so if you pick the let's do nothing option, you're, you're not just going to close and enter post-closure. You're also going to have to go ahead and find a place for that waste to go. The most logical method to do that is what we would call transfer station. You permit and construct a transfer station. All your small vehicles that collect the waste in the community are going to go to that transfer station. They're going to dump their waste on a concrete floor. They're going to load it into a transfer trailer, and it's going to go to another landfill. All right, that other landfill is going to be owned by somebody else. That other landfill is going to have a set rate for disposal, and you're now having a contract with whatever landfill or landfills to take that waste going forward. So you lose some autonomy of not being able to control your own set tip fee, but you're closing up your landfill and you're not continuing to expand the existing one. So that's the they kind of just let's just close what we got and move on with life type thing. But you will have a, a transfer station. Um, you know, probably going to be a million and a half dollars to build one of these, um, and then you're going to enter that post closure period. You should have money set aside for closure and post closure that's sitting sitting in a bank account, and that money is obligated for that purpose. But that's the way that goes. Now, the other two options are generally the same option. One's smaller and one's bigger. All right, so I'm going to pick on the smaller option. The smaller option is we need to go ahead. We want to stay in the landfill business, let's say, and we want to expand our landfill. All right, so you're going to go through a permit process where you do a whole bunch of engineering studies and make sure that the land is suitable for development, and you're going to permit what I'll call a small expansion. Let's just call it a 10 or 15 acre footprint. That's in addition to your 30. You're going to get it permitted. You're going to build it, and that's the big money when you start building it. You're going to be the four or five hundred thousand dollar an acre range, so ten times four or five hundred, you get four or five million bucks to build it. But you stay in the landfill business, and you have another eight to ten years, maybe in that 15 acre sale for the purposes of storing waste and just and properly disposing of it in accordance with these regulations. All right, that permitting effort is going to take time. And so one of the reasons I'm here tonight is that, not tonight, but we really need to make a decision if that's something the community's interested in doing. We've got to make that decision here pretty quick. Let's just say sometime between the end of the first quarter and the beginning of the second quarter in that, in that April, June time frame type, something like that. That's reasonable, but if you wait much longer than that, what is likely going to happen 
is none of us control the regulatory environment in which we're trying to seek a permit. It will take at least a year to get all the studies together. It will take at least another year, year and a half to obtain those permits and at least another year to build. A year plus a year and a half plus a year, three and a half years, maybe four years, and we have to have the cell built. Otherwise, the same thing happens, right? We're out of places to put waste and we got to move forward. Order of magnitude, you know, those permitting activities, and it's done in phases. It's not all in up front. You don't have to go all in, but you do have to start making those decisions at any point in the process. You may find out that that expansion is not viable. There may be some technical reason that the groundwater is too high or a different myriad of reasons that some, for some reason you may just say, I want to expand, but I can't. I just can't do it. Can't go, and then you have to pull the plug. So it is a process, so it's not all in, but order of magnitude, you know, something on the vicinity of maybe half a million dollars, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars, that small expansion. All right. Um, but you gotta kinda go if you're gonna go. Otherwise you're gonna run airspace, you're gonna be building that same transfer station. All right. The other option is what I call go big. That's the big expansion. All right? Same thing happens. We're looking at a lot larger footprint. And we're really maybe putting a footprint on the map that's a lot longer time frame than eight or ten years. You may go from we got a lined acre, a line landfill of 30 acres. We're going that small expansion is 15. The big expansion is 30 acres lined. It may be 50 or 70 new acres. So now you're going to square up a hundred acre footprint. All right. Now we're talking some pretty large airspace, long time frame. All right. Now, one thing I will mention, I did the left-hand line, line, line footprint, right-hand unlined. One of the things that the big expansion would do is it would take that unlined unit, excavate it over time, probably a 20-year time frame, and we would put that old waste over a line unit. Obviously, there's some benefits to that, right? It's expensive, we're digging up old waste, but we're putting it over a line unit and we're removing an environmental liability. The unlined unit, like all unlined units for the most part, is leaking into the groundwater and we're monitoring the corrective action, okay? Um, so there's a benefit there, an environmental benefit, to gobble it up and put it over line. But you're going big and you're going with maybe a 70 to 100 acre footprint over time, you don't build it all at once, and you've got some longevity, maybe the opportunity to take waste from other areas, maybe not completely up to the community's decision, but you get to make that decision. now. You're thinking, well, he's going from 15 acres to 70 acres. I bet you that's five times the permitting cost. It's not. It's maybe 10 or 15 percent more. It may be a 350 or 400 thousand dollar permit cost to a 500 thousand dollar permit cost. So the economies are scaled. If you wanted to go expansion wise, I would tell you to go big. Go ahead and, and get some value for your money, and go ahead and get a, a bigger a bigger footprint for the long term viability of the site. But the time frame is the same, really. You're going to do the same studies over the same time, but we got to get pretty serious about going sometime here before June-ish time frame. Otherwise, it just physically won't be enough time to do it, permit, and construct it. Now, an option expansion small, expansion big, we're not closing the line landfill. We're keeping that money in our pocket for closure, post-closure. We're staying in the business. Um, if you closing, you know, fill it up, close and go, you're, you're going ahead and incurring that liability now. So at a real high level, that's really kind of the basis of what, you know, the community and um, you're going to be asked to decide is, is which way do we go. Um, anything? So, Mr. Chairman, just briefly, we, you said in on, a, on a, you know, about an hour long meeting uh, prior to this, and I've said in one with, with our folks at the city. Uh, I think Michael did just what he said. He gave you the 5,000 foot view. Uh, there, there's some moving parts and pieces that, that this, this board really needs to understand uh, in the difference of, you know, what happens if we close? What happens if we mothball? What happens if we What's the advantages of, of building a, a, a big, uh, bigger footprint? What's the disadvantages of building a bigger footprint? Uh, what, what that means to, 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 to the community? And, You've said in an hour long meeting, you know, we can't cover it tonight in, in the amount of time we've got. So, I mean, our staff recommendation is that we get Michael back in here for a work session that just covers the landfill. 
uh, now that you've got that brief overview, and, uh, and, and some of us have an hour uh, long overview, we can begin to have some discussions. I talked to Emily uh, before the meeting, she and I are going to get together tomorrow so I can talk to her about some of the stuff we talked about today. <coughs> but uh, I mean, I think unless you've got direct questions from Michael tonight, uh, our, I mean, sooner rather than later, we, we need to, to schedule a, a time for him to come back and, uh, and just have a work session with talking about nothing but what we're going to do about the land to it on, on this store road. Any questions? <coughs> I got one, Commissioner Wood. Uh, I'm all for, I know this is a very detailed discussion, but I would like to know when we meet, what true funds do we have that are sitting there reserved to close down the landfill to maintain, if we closed it, to maintain it for the years needed? And, you know, and Mr. Mr. Long, how it will in the office, take and I care think, of you know, not, I mean, I don't know that tonight's the time to do that, but he's prepared to answer those questions, aren't you? Yeah. There? Uh, yeah. Uh, right now, no, I, don't, have, I don't need it now. Well, it just takes a few minutes. <laughs> it's just virtual. Go, go ahead. Yeah. We, uh, we have $8.3 million in financial assurance for post-closure. Is that a reserve account? Yes, and it's with uh, Alan Mooney and Barnes. 8.3? Yeah, 8.3. And over the years, that we have set aside funds for a future expansion or additional financial assurance, and we have $5.4 million sitting there. So the 8.3 for the closure, and then the $5.4 million for future Expansion or financial assurance or whatever you need to. Now you say expansion or financial assurance. Tell me what that is. Well, I know what expansion, expansion is. What's the insurance part? Okay, that's for post closure. Yeah, that's the eight point three million dollars. So we got thirteen point seven million dollars. Right. Yeah. But the okay. eight point three is for yeah, closure of the So I think the answer maybe to answer your question there, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but so let's not decide that we needed. We decided we needed to close the landfill. Mm -hmm. Then, then that expansion money would, would also become closure money, exactly. and, and, and it would all it. go towards yeah. closure. Yeah. But if, it, if we expand the footprint of the landfill, then we're not closing it, right? So then we got eight point three in closure, post closure money, and that other money becomes the money that we expand the current footprint with. Is that right? Right. right. But five point four million, you have options on it, but eight point three million yeah. is for closure. Yeah, no, you're right, and, and I think that, that I don't know that eight point three. Would, would, would close it, but with the 8.3 and the 5.4, if we close it right now, we, we get real close to, uh, closer to that number. And I don't know exactly right, right now. I just, I just like to so, so that. So that's why I said yeah. that I think we need to have an a, a hour long meeting and, and yeah. the folks from the city are willing to come back and, and be part of that discussion. Uh, it's just, I don't want to bombard you with a whole lot of information tonight that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And, uh, and we, you know, we've got a-, a I just like true money. But yeah, we got yeah, this. I mean, so I mean, the, the, just ain't something to play with with the citizens. Well, well there, there's there's two money. there's two things that, that, that we're talking about here. There's a political decision about uh, bringing waste in, into the community, keeping waste in the community, and then then there's a business decision about how we move forward with, with dealing with that because it, it is a dollar and cent business. It, it's run like a business. It's run like an enterprise fund. So there's got to be some discussions about what makes sense moving forward, and, and y'all have to really understand that to be able to make a a good vetted decision and that's that's why I think Mike needs to come back and uh, and we need to get Larry I mean he's run the numbers and, and he's provided those so uh, he told you what those numbers are so you know as we look at making these choices then you, then you start plugging those numbers into the different scenarios and you know what we got what it's gonna cost those kind of things and uh, I just think you know having Mr. Stubbs back down and, and, and maybe the folks from the city over here to, to, to meet with that would be much more beneficial than trying to to rush to a decision tonight when right. you've got some, you need a little time. A lot. Yeah, as far as the 8.3 <coughs> being adequate for post-closure, we report those numbers to the state and they check our ratios and everything and those meet their requirements. So, okay. so we do that every year. Okay. Thank you. So any more questions from Mike? Really, I, I, I completely would have missed. I should say on option one or option two, the landfill footprint would most likely be located on land you already own, roughly the 278 acres or so that you own. However, if you do expand, you're definitely going to need additional land, not for footprint, but for soil borrow, the life of a landfill is they need, they need access to reliable clay soil, and so that you would have to acquire additional property to bring 
cover dirt. Cover dirt. Thank you. And clay in. But the footprint right now, as envisioned, would be on land currently owned. I believe is probably the hardest thing. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Mike. Tony, has everybody signed this signing sheet? Everybody? Am I the last one in? Or, um, <laughs> Does everybody need to sign or just? No, no. Everybody doesn't need to sign that, y'all. I, mean, I think it's for the public hearing. Yeah, it's for the public hearing. Folks can come up and talk about that. Uh, Mike, I'll give you a call. Okay. We'll kind of work our schedule out. Thank you. Thank you. Emily? Yeah. Call you Mark. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're to item four on the agenda of items that we added to the agenda. I we do have one item that needs to be added. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, as, as, as we have discussed, um, the, we need to add um, the item, we add one of the item one. 8.3. 8.3, and it'll be for uh, property acquisition. Okay. I have a motion to add property acquisitions to the regular agenda. So move. Second. All right, we need to look at our minutes from workshop session on January 3rd. Executive session on January 3rd and regular session. Um, yeah, and regular session on January 9th. I make a motion that we accept the minutes as presented. <coughs> we have a second. Second. Mr. Stoddard, okay. All in favor? All right, thank you. All right, we're to the public hearing uh, section of the agenda 6.1, the comprehensive plan update transmittal. Ms. Beretta Hill, will come speak to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'm here tonight just um, for the transmittal of transmit it, um, we get back, sometimes they send stuff, extra things that they want to have in the plan, and between now and then you may have something else that you want in there, um, but this is for the transmittal only, and then once um, it's approved by DCA to move forward, um, I will come back to you for um, adoption, and all you will have are required to do at that time is a sign resolution. Um, but I do want um, to um, reiterate that this is a working document. Um, you will be required to use this comp plan. Um, anytime you're making any decisions on projects that are listed in this comp plan, you, you always need to pull it. Don't keep it on the shelf. It needs to be used um, for your projects. It needs to be used for uh, rezoners. Um, Anytime you have a rezoning that includes your current comp plan, you have to look at your comp plan and see what that area is designated for. Um, you have to make sure that it meets the character areas um, for any um, rezoning. Um, and to, in order to approve the rezoning according to the um, Georgia um, Zoning Act, you have to, um, you have to um, answer the question whether or not it is consistent with your comp plan. So this is, like I said, a working document. Um, you want to make sure that you have all your projects in it for the next five years, especially if you're going to be applying for a CDBG grant or anything, any type of grant that's required to be in your um, comprehensive plan. Uh, we can amend it at any time if you don't have something in there that needs to be placed in there at a later date if you have a project that comes up. Um, but um, you can always amend it for that, but um, look at it, make sure that your projects that you want to do in the next five years are in there, so that way you don't have to come back before you for an amendment. Okay, any questions? Yes, Chairman, I would just point out that uh, the, the, the update, you know, we have copies of it here and at each of the cities and at uh, www.strc. Uh, dot us. So if anybody wants to go to look at it, it, it it's there uh, for review. And as, as Brad just said, uh, we still got a few steps to go through here, so there's time for addition or you know changes to be made if that's necessary. Okay. Do we need a vote for our to be able to transmit it? Or? Okay. Thank 
Mr. Ryle. Yes, um, we appreciate it. We're going to, the process for our comprehensive plan requires you to have a public hearing on every decision that's made. There's been a lot of work that's already gone in to develop the comprehensive plan, and so really all we're doing tonight is is ultimately making a decision to transmit that so it'll become part of our, our uh, operating document. Um, is there anyone here, I'm going to open a public hearing, and with the, is there anyone here <coughs> that has an interest in speaking about or toward the issue of the comprehensive plan? Okay, so, so the, did you sign, you did no, not I sign this. So everybody that signed their signing sheet, they're here for the second public hearing, which is on another issue. Is that fair? All right, so I just want to, so what we'll do is, I'll just let you state your name in the record if you when I open the public hearing, and then we'll be good to go. All right. Uh, we'll consider the public hearing open at this time, and if anybody from the audience wants to speak to that issue, please come. Julie Lester, 139 Millbury Circle. Really, I just want to thank Loretta for her hard work on this. <laughs> um, I went to those meetings. I know how hard it is sometimes to like wrangle us. And I know Mr. Davis, and I know some of the commissioners were at some of the meetings, other members of the community. So really, it's just a thank you for all the hard work that goes into it. But I. I do want to reiterate what she said, and you all know this, that it's very important when we're making our zoning decisions and planning decisions and land use decisions to refer back to this plan for our future and make sure that we're following um, what the vision of the community and the various stakeholders are whenever we are making these zoning decisions and land use decisions. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks. All right. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the the plan? Then we'll close the public hearing and this matter goes to action. All right. So we have a motion to approve the transmittal of a comprehensive plan to the CA. <coughs> so moved. Like Commissioner Wood moved. I'll second. Commissioner Wood seconded. All in favor? All right. And we come to 6.2 public hearing TCZA 23-01 petition being made by Mark Fletcher, owner and Stein agent for a special exception to allow a solar farm to be constructed at 4192 Georgia Highway 125 North, tax amount 0057, parcel 008, the parcel is 26 and a half acres and is zone agriculture. Chris Davis. Good evening, board. First of all, I'd like to clarify there was a change uh, to the request made this morning. Um, they are no longer seeking 26.5 acres. They have downsized their footprint to a 24.4 footprint. And that new map is in the books. We should have a new layout of the new floor plan for their project. It doesn't change location, it just changed size. <clears throat> they actually could get by with less land, and that's why they're trying to not encroach as much land as they need to, only what they have to have. And it's page 42 in the paper. <clears throat> I'll give you a second. Let's look at that. Like I said, it didn't change uh, the location. It just went down in size. Their so original so. map is on page 41, and the new map is on 42. If you want to compare. Just as the chairman has read, we received an application for a special exception from Mr. Mark Fletcher, the owner of the property, Nick Stein is his acting agent. As you all are aware, back on September 13th of 2021, we approved and adopted a very respectable, very restraining solar farm ordinance for the county. We made it <coughs> in ag zoned areas and commercial areas, but also with a special exception attached that each one would come before the board for review. We received this application from Mr. Mark and Mr. Nick. The property is that's located at 4192 Georgia Highway 125 North, tax map 0057, parcel 008. Henry, sent in their application, we went ahead and gave Mr. Nick our ordinance because there's a lot of details in there about what they have to meet, what they have to do just to get to this point, site plans, decommissioning plans. We do have uh, their decommission plan as requested by our ordinance. We do have that on the file. We posted the property with a sign. We put ads in the paper. We held the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, heard it on January 12th, 2023. 
the vote was a four to one vote in recommendation of approval. As you can tell, there's other solar farms in the area. According to your maps, you have a packet, there's one further north, mm -hmm. and then there's one to the west. Uh, the one to the north uh, is in the county, which is there by the church. The one that's to the west is within the city limits. Or tip. How far is the one that's to the north? It's on the same? Same stretch of road, approximately uh, half a mile, maybe a mile at the most. A different developer, at the time the one on same road, road 125, at that time we did not have the ordinance. Like I stated, this board adopted that ordinance September 13, 2021. That solar farm was prior to that. Um, this would be the first solar farm that we would have in here that would have to adhere to the solar farm ordinance that you have adopted. Like I said, you know, there are specific requirements in our ordinance. Their land is zoned ag, which is one of the requirements. And then he's provided, Mr. Stein has provided all the requirements that meets our ordinance. Like I said, planning commission is met on January 12th, 4 to 1, in favor of a recommendation. We had the planning commission, there were a few folks there in opposition, but then there was a couple that was here as well uh, in favor. Our office has not fielded any calls recently concerning the solar farm. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions from the board if you have any from So, so there's nothing in these 11 criteria that would uh, would uh, say that this shouldn't be approved, in your opinion? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Uh, the, you know, as, so for everybody's knowledge, the planning commission does not meet on how they feel or what they think. They meet on all the criteria of the application, meeting 11 standards. And that board sits those and goes down through each standard, and they review that themselves and make a vote. All they, every one of them, they said met the requirements. They meet on the technical standard of the application. And, and everything, as far as we know, meets the criteria for the special exception that this board put in place in September of 21. That's correct. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, board. Thank you, Chris. Then it's time for us to open the uh, floor for the public hearing. And uh, so we'll consider this public hearing open. And what we'll do first is we'll receive comment for anyone that's in support of special exception TC-ZA-23-01. Does anybody speak on behalf? Please state your name, address, for the record, please. Okay, uh, my name is Nick Stein, and um, my address is uh, 139. Foreman Street, Atlanta, Georgia, um, 33315. Well, thank you. I'll keep it, uh, thanks Chris for the introduction, I'll keep it um, short here. Uh, Mark Fletcher, uh, the landowner here in Tifton, approached us to build a solar farm on his property, and, um, and that's what we're, uh, we've designed uh, working with Chris and Regina, have designed it uh, per the solar ordinance, the county solar ordinance, and um, and we, you know, uh, we of course build it uh, in the same manner. So, um, that's, unless anybody has any specific questions, I did ask uh, Denver Braswell, um, chairman of the board of commissioners in Colco County, to to come on our behalf today. He's uh, Obviously, could relate to you from a commissioner standpoint, but he also um, is a landowner for two of our um, solar farms in Colco County. So instead of me, of course, having a little bit of a biased opinion on why we're, uh, you know, we'll do what we say we're going to do, I just thought, you know, if anybody had any questions, Denver, um, it'd be a good person to ask. So. What's the life of your solar farms? Um, where this is a 30 year purchase power agreement, um, but if you just let it sit out there, it would probably last, we think, about 40 years, uh, the equipment. Okay. What kind of, uh, what kind of energy or power would the uh, project like this produce? As far as right. homes or? Yeah. I think, just, um, just have a general idea of what, what kind of impact it'll have. I think, um, you know, 
if you had, I can get talk a little bit more towards it and find you know, somebody else that I work with to give you a, a better answer. But I think it's about 10,000 homes. Um, Over what period of time? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't want to um, get a little bit technical over my head with the, uh, on the power side. But, um, but I'll get you there. Do you, uh, I understand that you're in the business of, uh, of, of building solar farms. Do you have any, uh, obviously you can tell us the pros of a solar farm, do you have any uh, drawbacks of a solar farm of this size or anything that you can tell us about? I mean, I think so. We, we come in, it takes about, you know, this one we don't have to do any land work, so it'll take about six weeks on the mechanical side, six weeks on the electrical side to put it in place. We'll have about 20 tractor trailers, 25 tractor trailers come in full of materials. They'll come in and drop it off. We'll, ha we'll have around 15 guys, workers, um, putting it together. And then once it's installed, we'll be gone and they'll be, you know, Unless something goes wrong, which they typically, there's not much that goes wrong. Would be like two people per year coming in to maintain it. Any, anything in the uh, the ordinance that we have in place now with regard to the solar farms? Do you see anything that would be problematic down the road for this project or anything? No, uh, the y'all's ordinance is pretty typical uh, for Georgia, so everything's pretty simple. So y'all have designed and built solar farms pretty much to this standard already. No, y'all are. What's the teardown cost going to be in 30 years? Um, we've got, we hired a... Let's let our questions be asked directly to the board and then if they want those redirected to him, you know, he can speak up and okay. after y'all bring forth your, your concerns if you make those known sure. as opposed to Q&A from the audience, okay? Who is responsible for, for tearing down though when, when, if and when that takes place? Is it the landowner or the company? No, it's us. Uh, it's the solar company. Who is the solar company? What was the answer? We are. Your company is responsible for that? Correct. And you have an escrow account? Or, uh, no, no, that's no, 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 we're not doing that. Let him speak, and then bring, bring the, let the question be addressed to the board, and then let him ask the Peace. Back there, please. I'll take care of it. What is the name of the company? Inman Solar. I N M A N. Okay. I'm sure it's, I've, I've read it down there, but I've read it several times. Uh, one question the maintaining. You see, so many of these little farms that just grow up, look like swamps, <coughs> forest, or something. Our regulations, zoning says it's got to be maintained on a regular basis. Would that be done? It'll be, um, I think, everywhere is a little different down here. We mow about six times, six times a year during mowing season. Um, so I think about every three weeks it gets mowed during mow during warmer months. And then, um, like I said, it's a, I think there's about two, you know, semi-annual inspections twice a year uh, where they come in. If there's anything else <coughs> that needs to be maintained, they'll be identified. Be identified. The entire farm have a fence around it. Yes, that's what? part. Of, sorry, that's part of the ordinance. And the height of that fence is. Uh, I think the AC code is six feet, and so ours is six feet plus one foot of barbed wire, seven feet tall. Any other questions from the commission? Okay. Is anybody else here that would like to speak to or on behalf of this project? Like I said. Uh, you want to say anything? Or you? I mean, I, I know it's pretty straightforward. You're the landowner, and then, like I said, Denver's here. I might be happy to have, have any questions, but you don't want to buy it depending on um, if you do well on that. Right, well, let's hear from those that are in opposition, and they'll probably raise some questions, and then we'll ask you to come back. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Uh, what order would you?
y'all have to come in. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Dustin Griffin. I was out at 4165 Georgia Highway 125 North. A little bit about myself. I am pro solar. I currently work for ADT Solar and do residential solar. I have solar on my house, and I've had solar since 2019, but I am 100% opposed to this. And the reason why is because of this. I do feel like you guys put the ordinance in place to protect the, the county, but I feel like the main purpose of your ordinance is what's not, you know, again, not, you know, not being looked at. So if you guys look at the purpose of your ordinance, to provide definitions relating to solar systems, energy production facilities, and standards to guide the development of solar energy systems and facilities in order to protect the public health, safety, welfare, and avoid significant impacts on resources and adjacent uses. Go down just a step further. Encourage the location of solar production facilities to the extent possible areas where the potential adverse impacts on the community will be minimized. How will this form minimize any adverse impacts on the town? It's directly in front of my home. This is what I look at every morning when I leave the work. What I look at on my front porch every day. This will go right across the street. It will be in the side of our house, their house. The new subdivisions that have just been built will be in their side yards and in their backyard. We'll go a step further. Recycling cost. This was brought up. I already went with this in the city. We bought this with the city on the one that's behind our house, right on the interstate. The cost to recycle a panel currently, national average, twelve to twenty-five dollars per panel. Tip County currently has over thirty thousand panels in this county. We're still combined. The landfill cost is roughly two dollars per panel. Great that we had a landfill meeting tonight. That's definitely something to consider when looking at this. You guys have We'll now have three farms that this one is approved within a five year span that's going to go in this land for potential. Something to consider. <clears throat> if you just want to break down the cost, if you were to put those 30,000 30, pounds that are currently in the county into the landfill, you're looking at roughly $60,000 cost on the either business or that one, that landlord, if you don't have a contract in or else. Those panels are recycled. Minimum cost $360,000, maximum $750,000 for the current panels that are installed in this county, not including this farm. Directly, this farm will directly affect me. When I purchased my home, my wife and I chose to live there and to raise our kids there. We put a lot of money in our homes to increase the value of our home. I will ask all of you on this board, would any of you want to buy a home or be interested in a home that has solar directly in front of it? This will directly affect home value, my home value, because it's not going to be near the building to the home market. Definitely something to consider. Just to kind of recap on some of the questions that you guys asked him, I know a little bit, some of them work a little better. Decrease home value. Drawbacks, I believe it's your question. Drawbacks, decrease home value for around us. I sort. How many want to wake up every day and that's what you look at? Recycling costs, teardown costs. Yes, company may pay for it. Who's going to help that? Landfill issues, we already have them. Lost revenue. Look at what's being built currently right beside that property. How much more money can this county make by homes being built there versus landlocking that property for the next 30 or 40 years? Mowing every three weeks. I would love to see that or not. Because I live by the park farm and have lived there since the farm's been built. They move maybe three or four times a year. I understand that this policy is not in place when that farm is built. It is in place now. And I do feel like there's a lot of issues in this policy that we didn't address or didn't do it. For instance, Mr. Davis. When I approached Mr. Davis before the first meeting, I asked for a copy of this. They provided the copy. I also asked for a copy of what products he was using, what trackers were being used, and other products so I could properly research the warranty of those products so I could bring it to the board tonight, just like I did with the city. I have a copy of what I took to the city on their meeting. I'll be more than happy to do that research. Most tractors have a five to 10 year warranty. For all of you that live near me, you can see the car farm. How many months do those tractors sit there broke and not operate properly? That's an eyesore for everybody that lives around it. I live around it. I drive by daily. How many of you do that? Definitely ask you guys to take this into consideration when you guys are making your decision tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you, guys. <coughs>
local econ economy over the years. Last year alone, accelerated builders made a notable contribution to the base of the tax base in excess of $7 million. With this being said, accelerated builders would like the committee to consider this opinion before making a final decision on the solar farm on Highway 125. In our opinion, the solar farm can be viewed from the northern parts, most parts of our subdivision, designed for the future. This will be very close to new, newly finished homes and take away from the beauty of the neighborhood that we have worked so hard to create. This solar farm may produce excessive noise from the operation of its equipment and can be dangerous for children that may be curious and want to explore the area. We believe the installation of a solar farm in close proximity to a residential neighborhood carries unnecessary <coughs> risks and potential negative outcomes. Residents should not be subjected to the potential of their homes being negatively affected, disturbed by noise, or even worse, the safety of their children being at risk. In fact, we believe the installation of the solar farms in close proximity to residential neighborhoods should be avoided altogether. Finley Chase Subdivision has put in a considerable investment of time, energy, and money in the creation of beautiful homes within the boundaries of its first and second phases. To safeguard this investment, solar farms should not be located in the area to residential, residential neighborhoods and such should not be allowed near the proposed phase three. Although solar farms are beneficial to the environment and offer sustainable energy options, their operation and presence should not interfere with the quality of life of those near our residential neighborhoods. For this reason, accelerated builders will oppose the installation of the solar farm near their proposed future project phase three. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next. Justin Back, I live at 70 Waterfront uh, in uh, the County, just north of Brighton Road on uh, 125 and, and Brighton Road. Um, I've seen massive solar farms built throughout the state. Uh, they're certainly in abundance, and I think that they're fantastic. I think that the right place, the right location, it probably makes a lot of sense. And a lot of those areas are very rural, uh, where there's really nothing else around there that would be detracted, uh, detraction. And so I think this proposed location, though, because it is so traffic, it's so, I mean, there's a lot of development going along that route right there, uh, as well as the current homes that are already in place. Uh, it seems that this is not the ideal location to build one of these farms. Now, I did have a, a, a sneak peek at the plan, and it sounds like there's a two acre um, that's not going to be used in the, in, or necessary for the plan, and looking on the map that you've seen, that two acres is to the back of the property. I don't know if there's a compromise that can be made that, to put the farm there, but leave those front two acres, let that be developed into something beautiful, um, and, and behind that, have more of that solar, thing that takes place. They're not, I guess they're designed on the fence, but this is prison style fencing. Chain link with barbed wire, it does not look good. It does not provide any beautification to it. There could be an improvement into the fencing that goes around such a structure. All the transmission equipment, is the, as we see the one to the north, it's located right on the road. And so the upkeep, which again, if I mowed my lawn every three, three weeks, or three months or whatever the number is, uh, I'd be kicked out of the neighborhood. Um, this should be kicked out of the neighborhood as well. Um, unless there are something, there's something because of its proximity to town, to where people are living and others that have expressed their concerns, especially this gentleman that lives right across the street, it shouldn't be there. There's plenty of other alternatives, better locations suited for such a, such a project um, that ultimately is an eyesore and there doesn't seem to be a way around it. Thank you. Thank you. Next. I just kind of had some, I'm Shane Hudson, um, I live where Mr. Beck does. I just, ha you know, What's your all, address? all of this county What's your address? Uh, 36 long time ago. All of this is kind of new to me, but I'm just wondering in the, in the um, ordinance, does it give you guys the right to deny the application? Do y'all have that right? And just because they meet criteria, do you have to grant it? Does anybody know? a special exception. That's why you have a public hearing to get input from the community to evaluate 
those in the balance and evaluate those various interests. So I mean, you guys can deny the application, right? Yeah. I mean, so you're sitting here, and there's got to be some, you know, in my mind, some reason why it makes sense other than somebody's looking to make some money. I mean, that's what this is about. If someone get it twisted, somebody's going to make money off this. A gentleman drove down from Atlanta. And maybe it makes sense. I don't know. He's not here for his well-being. But it's about money. And these things are everywhere. And they're encroaching. You know, I don't know how I feel about it. But just my eyes tell me this is getting a little, a little long in the tooth. We're seeing these things pop up everywhere. And at the end of this, when these things are popping up everywhere, somebody's going to lose money. And then somebody's going to be left holding back. It may not be this guy back here. His company may be great. But in my experience, when somebody's left holding the bag, those guys are gone. And it's us holding it. And all these costs that we're talking about, that's going to be us incurring it. And then it looks like crap. So now we got eyesores all over the place. And I don't know that this is the place to stop it. But at some point, we got to stop it, or otherwise all our land's going to have its stuff all over. And that's the reason why we are what we are. We're not the peak people in Atlanta or wherever all these things are. Why do you think he's driving all the way down here to put a solar panel out in the country? Because he can do it here. He can't do it up there. Or he'd be building it in Atlanta. Land's cheap here. They get tax incentives to do all these things. So they're taking our land that we grow stuff on, put this crap on. I don't know. Listen. I'm all for making money, don't get me wrong. But that's what this reeks of. And the point is, at some point, we gotta stop. Where does it go? And, you know, maybe this isn't the time to stop it. I don't have that answer. It just feels uncomfortable when we have people who are, you know, building houses, building their lives around what's around them. And now we're putting up a chain link fence. I guarantee you, nobody in this room wants that outside their house. And that should mean something. It just really should. And, you know, maybe it shouldn't always be about money. I don't know. What's the, do y'all know what the county's getting out of this? Like, are we getting the power? No. Huh? No. This power yeah. can go anywhere in the state. Yeah, so like, what are we doing it for? What's the point? Do y'all know if we're getting the power? Or do we know we're not getting the power? Is it gonna help anybody in the county? Power sold back to the power company. They control the power. So it's the power comes, you put this stuff on the land. It used to be beautiful land. It goes to some power company. Who makes that money? It ain't us. But we're going to be holding the bag one day. And you know, you guys are the face of our county, and we put our trust in you. You're our elected officials. You know, at some point, y'all are the guys that got to go, okay, this is getting a lot of hand. It feels that way to me because where I see them every um, I just appreciate your time and what you did for us. <clears throat> How y'all doing? I'm Jordan Pope, 56 Water Front, uh, 15 Georgia, 317-94. I spoke at the last uh, preliminary meeting, and um, like I said, I think all of us in this room is kind of jealous that we don't own this land, and this is like striking gold in South Georgia. If you have land that you can, you know, be under this power line. Um, but with that being said, every I'm, all I'm doing is kind of circling back on it, what everybody said here. Um, real fast, when we sold, I, I've sold several dollar generals in this town. I made money. <coughs> it happened, you know. But we have one right across the street from our office, right? And we we were we came in here, we were against it, didn't want it to happen. And they looked to us in our face and said, we're different. This isn't going to be like the rest of the Dollar Generals. We mow our grass every week. We, we won't have stuff selling on the curb. Well, it's happening. And who, no, nobody here is making them abide by the rules that they sat here and told us that it's going to happen on. This is another Dollar General in my eyes going where it shouldn't. It should not be going. Whenever new doctors come into town and new administration and new uh, nurses, uh, anybody coming with a hospital, which is 
which is the heartbeat of our, our town, I get, I get the privilege of being able to show them Tiffany. And right now we have other issues at hand with the solar, the solar farm. We have a homeless situation that we're dealing with. We have Dollar Generals that aren't cleaning up the parking lots and there's trash everywhere. And I'm having to dodge all this stuff while I give them an hour and a half community tour twice a week uh, for what the hospital's doing here. To me, it's a slap in the face. It's typical, you know, for us trying to get new industry here. When Coca-Cola came, if Eric, if Eric Summers and, and Fred had not had their, their subdivisions here, we would not be able to handle the employees that they brought here. If, if that subdivision alone, there and out there at the Cove at Willow Creek, if we did not have that, we would not be able to house the people that came here and filled up 350 jobs that they brought with them. And Eric and Fred took a leap of faith. Not only just them, there's a thousand other builders in this town, but they took a leap of faith and they came and, and are trying to build nice subdivisions and they're, and they're making it look good. They're not just throwing up cookie cutter homes. So at the end of the day, we've got to stop it somewhere because if, if we agree to allow this place here and, it, and it, they abide by all the rules and this is the special stuff and they say they're going to do everything, that's fine. But if we agree to this one, then these fields wrap all the way down under these power lines, all the way down Brighton Road. We can't say no to anymore. If you agree to this one, we can't say no to the next one. And then they're going to continue to be completely surrounding tipped and will be known as the homeless solar power capital of the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my eyes. So, anyway, thank you. Scott Shaver, 74 Long Pine, here in Tipton. And I guess I have questions. What, and it tells into uh, what Shane said, what mechanism does the county have to ensure that the builder who says he is going to be responsible for the cleanup in 30 years has the money set aside in 30 years? What mechanism do y'all have to ensure that money's there? Or are you going to come to me and ask me to pay taxes? You got, you got an account for the uh, landfill, 8.3 million and 5.4, did they ever say? Good, we need that. What mechanism is there to clean up this if he's not in business? Or if he is in business, are you checking his books to see he's got an escrow account that says, Tiff County plot number five, I've got X number of dollars to clean this up in 30 years set aside? Who's going to monitor that? What mechanism do y'all have? It's a question. I'm just looking for an answer. You have one. And if he goes out of business, who pays? Does he have to deposit money into the Tip County budget every year? So much, a thousand dollars or a hundred dollars for thirty years to make sure there's a cleanup fund there when he's gone. 